Hi, welcome to Deep Recaps. Today's film is the cult classic psychological thriller, Donnie Darko. Spoilers ahead, watch out and enjoy the ride. The film opens on a picturesque view of a mountain range. It is dawn. Our protagonist, a teenaged boy named Donnie Darko, lies unconscious in the middle of the road, his bicycle nearby. As he awakens, he gazes at the landscape before him. He looks confused, uncomfortable, even disassociated. But then, he smiles. Donnie rides his bike into the small town of Middlesex, Virginia. It's the 80s, and technology has yet to ruin humankind's ability to think critically, or to pay attention to something for longer than 30 seconds. Donnie's sister, Elizabeth, approaches his father, Eddie, only to be playfully deflected by the power of his leaf blower. Donnie enters his home through the back door and heads straight for the fridge. We see, where is Donnie, written on the dry erase, indicating that he has been missing. That night, tensions quickly escalate during a family dinner. Elizabeth, played by Jake Gyllenhaal's real-life sister, Maggie, makes a remark about Donnie being off of his pills. Later, Donnie broods in his room. His mother, Rose, enters with some hesitation. She is concerned over Donnie's habit of disappearing at night and asks if he's been toilet papering the neighbor's home. He retorts that he hasn't done that in a while. He hurts his mom's feelings and she leaves. Donnie heads to the bathroom to take his pills. That night, everything changes. A disembodied voice tells Donnie to wake up. He stands awkwardly and shuffles outside to a nearby golf course. A large man wearing a surreal green rabbit costume is seen standing on a green in the distance. Donnie smirks, almost knowingly, as the rabbit speaks. 28 days, 6 hours, 42 minutes, 12 seconds. That is when the world will end. Elizabeth returns home. All is quiet until... The following morning, two men, Dr. Fisher and Jim Cunningham, discover Donnie unconscious on the golf course and tell him to go home. He returns to a scene of utter chaos. His family is relieved to see him. Somehow, some way, a jet engine has dropped out of the sky and through the roof of the Darko home, devastating Donnie's bedroom. That night, the family has been put up in a hotel room. The youngest Darko sibling, Sam, asks where the rest of the plane ended up, but no one knows. Donnie, who is remarkably unfazed, tells Sam that he's going to fart in her mouth. In the other room, Donnie's parents chew on the fact that Donnie has somehow dodged his fate. The next morning, as Donnie is dropped off at the bus stop, his classmates praise him for escaping death and ask if he's been sleepwalking again. We are then introduced to a few new characters at school. The new girl, Gretchen, teachers Kitty Farmer and Karen Pomeroy, the motivational speaker, Jim Cunningham, the bully who literally does blow in plain sight, and a quintet of dancing girls who don't know how to high-five. In class, Mrs. Pomeroy discusses Graham Greene's short story, The Destructors, about a group of robbers who burn the money they steal. Donnie elaborates that destruction is a form of creation. The robbers want to see what happens when they tear the world apart. They want to change things. Enter Gretchen, new to school. Pomeroy instructs her to sit next to whoever she thinks is the cutest and catches her glancing at Donnie. In a play that is pretty sus for a high school teacher, she orders the girl next to him to move. After school, Donnie is in the car with his dad, who talks to Donnie about therapy. He's not watching the road, and they almost hit an old woman. She's checking an empty mailbox. She whispers something in Donnie's ear. In therapy, Donnie says he's made a new friend. When asked whether the friend is real or imaginary, he openly admits that he's imaginary. His friend, Frank, told him to follow him into the future and that the world is coming to an end. Dr. Thurman asks if Donnie thinks the world is coming to an end. He says no, that's stupid. That night, Frank visits Donnie again. He takes an axe to an unknown location and begins swinging. It is now October 6th. That morning, the school bus doesn't arrive. School has been canceled because the building has flooded. Also, an axe has been buried in the head of the school statue. They made me do it is spray painted at its base. Nearby, Gretchen is being harassed. Donnie arrives to say school is canceled. She asks him to walk her home and they bond over the dark details of their lives. She had to move because her stepdad stabbed her mom and is on the run. Donnie once burned down a house. Sensing that things are going well and who wouldn't, he bluntly asks her out. She agrees. That night, Donnie's therapist hypnotizes him. She asks about Gretchen and he gets hung up on the subject. 
Dr. Thurman tries to change the subject, but his hands are already well on their way home. The next day, the police are collecting students' handwriting samples on the hunt for the vandal. Mullet Man fears they think it's him and threatens Donnie in the bathroom. Later, Donnie and his friends are shooting guns and drinking beers and talking about boobs. <laughs> Classic. In the distance, they see the old woman from before, who they call Grandma Death, peering into her empty mailbox again. That night, there is a PTA meeting. Mrs. Farmer thinks that Mrs. Pomeroy is to blame for the destroyed water main, as she's been lecturing the children on hedonistic books. Meanwhile, Donnie is busy with Frank again. Frank tells Donnie he can do anything he wants, and so can Donnie. He asks if Donnie believes in time travel. In class the following day, Mrs. Farmer presents the dichotomy of fear and love. Donnie refuses to participate, saying that things are not black and white. Life is not that simple. He tells her to forcibly insert the exercise into her anus. He is then suspended from after-school activities. It is now October 10th. Donnie asks his science teacher, Dr. Monotov, about time travel. He then learns about wormholes. Stephen Hawking says they can provide a shortcut between two distant regions of space-time, so long as you have a vessel that can travel at the speed of light. Monotov gives Donnie a book, The Philosophy of Time Travel, by Roberta Sparrow. She used to be a nun, but one day she became an entirely different person. She wrote this book and started teaching at their school. Chapter 1 of the book deals with the notion of a black hole that could end all of existence. Donnie checks out an old photo and realizes the author of the book is the old woman from the mailbox. Roberta Sparrow is Grandma Death. Donnie believes Frank wants him to go speak with her. He reveals to his therapist that, when Roberta whispered to him that day, she said that every living creature on Earth dies alone. Dr. Thurman asks if that scares him. He responds simply that he does not want to be alone. Later, Donnie sits in the living room with family and friends, watching football. He is clearly not interested in the sport. Suddenly, he witnesses something astounding. As each person in the room prepares to move, a sort of slipstream emerges from their bodies, as though Donnie is being granted a brief glimpse into the future. A stream of his own pools on his chest, amusing him. It guides him upstairs to his parents' room, where he finds a gun. It is now October 18th. At school, Gretchen notices blood on Donnie's neck. Later, as they walk together, Donnie tries to kiss her. She dodges his advance, saying that she wants to wait for a moment that reminds her of how beautiful the world can be. This isn't that moment, because Beverly Hills Ninja is watching them. That night, Donnie and Elizabeth carve pumpkins, Donnie doesn't know how to hold a knife. Or does he? Eddie and Rose visit Dr. Thurman, who asks if Donnie has ever told his parents about Frank. Yes, that Frank. Thurman says he's experiencing daylight hallucinations, a common symptom of paranoid schizophrenia. She wants to increase his medication. The next day, Jim Cunningham, a motivational speaker, performs his song and dance at the high school. He is the one who has been spreading all this talk of love and fear, who hopes above all to use his cut and dry religious overture to chase kids away from sex, drugs, and rock and roll. He begins to tell a story about a fictional man named Frank, which triggers Donnie. The dumb students ask Jim dumb questions, and he preaches nonsense about the reflection of the ego. Donnie then takes the mic to say that this is some of the worst advice I've ever heard. He calls Jim an antichrist and is escorted from the room. After school, Donnie rants at Gretchen about the incident. She asks if he's okay, and he unravels. He tells her about Grandma Death and her book, and that he's been hallucinating. The things he sees correlate to the book. The two then go to pay her a visit. When no one answers the door, they check the mailbox, which is empty, as always. They then spot her on the porch, as Frank speaks to Donnie once more. At another meeting with Dr. Monotov, Donnie muses about predestination. The two argue over whether or not we have free will. If we can see what they call God's channel, can we do anything to change the outcome? Monotov forcefully shuts the conversation down when Donnie intensifies. In class, as Donnie and Gretchen present a science project, a pre-famed Seth Rogen makes fun of Gretchen's family troubles. Donnie chases her outside, and the two share a kiss. That night, they go to the movies. Gretchen falls asleep, and Donnie smirks when he finds that he's been joined by another friend. He asks why Frank wears a stupid bunny suit. Frank claps back, asking Donnie why he wears a stupid man suit. Donnie's smirk fades, and he demands that Frank take it off. We are then shown Frank's true face, complete with a missing eye. Donnie asks why they call him Frank, and he says that was the name of his father, and his father before him. Donnie asks Frank when it's all going to stop. Frank says he should already know. Frank then says, 
I want you to watch the movie screen. There's something I want to show you. Have you ever seen a portal? Then, with a note of doomed finality, Frank instructs Donnie to burn it to the ground. As the bulk of the town attends a school talent show, Donnie sets fire to the home of Jim Cunningham. He gives a trademark smirk as Jim's self-portrait is engulfed in flame. He then returns to the theater before Gretchen wakes up. The next day, Eddie chastises Donnie for missing his little sister's dance routine. Donnie responds simply that he believes himself to be crazy. Eddie tells his son that honesty is the most important thing in life and that just about everyone on earth is full of shit. What do you say to people like that, Donnie? Read my lips. On the news, we see that a child pornography ring was discovered in the basement of the house that Donnie set fire to. Turns out the people Jim Cunningham motivated most were pedophiles. It is now October 24th. News spreads about the truth. Mrs. Pomeroy is informed that she will be fired for her unorthodox teaching. As her class studies the book Watership Down, Donnie rants angrily about the rabbits. Why should we feel sad about the death of a creature who never feared death to begin with? Gretchen says he's missing the point. The author cares for these creatures, so the reader must too. Mrs. Pomeroy says the most important factor is the deus ex machina, the god machine that saved the rabbits. Rose needs to go on a trip with Sam's dance troupe. As she tells Donnie that she'll be out for a while, he asks how it feels to have a wacko for a son. She says that it feels wonderful. Donnie writes a letter for Roberta Sparrow. He visits Miss Pomeroy, who tells him she's been fired. She teaches him that cellar door is said to be the most beautiful combination of letters in the English language. In therapy that night, Donnie is asked what makes him feel regretful, like he did when he didn't get hungry, hungry hippos. for Christmas. While hypnotized, he reveals that he flooded the school and he burned down Cunningham's house. He speaks of time travel and the end of all things, and his distress intensifies. He states that Frank is going to kill. Donnie's therapist wakes him up and informs him that the medication she's been giving him is fake, placebos. This woman should be fired. Donnie says his final goodbye to Dr. Thurman. It is now October 29th. Only one day remains until the world ends. Elizabeth informs Donnie that she got into Harvard. Donnie exclaims that they should throw a party since their parents are away. That night, at the party, Gretchen arrives looking upset and tells Donnie that her mom is gone. As Donnie takes her upstairs, Elizabeth asks her friends if anyone has seen Frank. It is now midnight. Only six hours remain. Donnie begins to feel out of sorts. The time travel penis is back at it again. He tells his friends that time is running out and they take off on their bikes. We are treated to a beautiful shot that would later result in the hit Netflix series, Stranger Things. They arrive at the house of Roberta Sparrow, only to find the door still locked. Donnie recalls what he saw on the chalkboard the previous day, and they head for the cellar door. They investigate, and Gretchen plays the piano badly. We're not sure what the bully's motive is, but they have knives. Seth is mad because he knows how much potential he has, but is frightened the world will never find out. A car then comes flying around the corner, hauling ass. Grandma Death stands in the driveway, as usual, and the car swerves, narrowly avoiding her. In doing so, it runs over and kills Gretchen. Two men get out of the car, nervous and terrified. The passenger turns to the driver and says, Frank. It is revealed that the driver is wearing a bunny suit and is in fact the very man Donnie saw in the theater that night. Donnie then shoots Frank in the face. And now we know what happened to his eye. Grandma Death then calmly states, The storm is coming, you must hurry. Donnie nods, now finally comprehending his fate, and drops the gun. He carries Gretchen's body home, takes his parents' car keys, and heads out to the driveway. He stares up at the storm, which looks suspiciously like a wormhole. He gets in the car, and we see Gretchen in the passenger seat. As he drives off, the police arrive at the Darko home. He pulls the car over at the same vista that we saw in the beginning of the movie. He sits on the hood, his dead girlfriend inside, watching the storm in the distance. He laughs to himself as he mutters that he is going home. Rose and Sam are seen on their flight home from the dance competition. Turbulence attacks their plane. Donnie gets back into the car. We are shown a montage of past happenings. All moments in time since the jet engine fell from the sky. In a voiceover, we hear Donnie's letter to Roberta Sparrow. Dear Roberta Sparrow, I've reached the end of your book, and there's so many things I need to ask you. Sometimes I'm afraid of what you might tell me. Sometimes I'm afraid that you'll tell me this is not a work of fiction. 
I can only hope that the answers will come to me in my sleep. I hope that when the world comes to an end, I can breathe a sigh of relief because there will be so much to look forward to. The time traveling montage lands us in Donnie's bedroom back on the night of the engine crash. Donnie is not out on the golf course with Frank. Donnie is in his bed, laughing hysterically to himself. He has accepted his fate, and moments later, the engine comes barreling through the ceiling. As the song Mad World haunts us all, we see the many residents of Middlesex, Virginia, experiencing the subconscious ripple effect of Donnie's death. This includes Frank, who unwittingly raises a hand to his right eye. Gretchen bikes by the Darko household. She is blissfully unaware of the existence of Donnie Darko. Not knowing that Donnie died so that she could live, she raises a hand and waves to Rose. Directed by Richard Kelly and released in 2001, this surrealist masterpiece became the first cult classic of a new millennium. Kelly uses the backdrop of the 80s, as well as a mainstream style of filmmaking against itself to be subversive, to give us something different from what we're used to, in the words of Donnie himself, to change things. The film firmly established Jake Gyllenhaal, who had already earned his stripes as a child actor in movies like October Sky, as a truly unique star, capable of making even the most unconventional heroes riveting to behold. This is a film that is more affecting in the mood it presents, and the way it lives on in the viewer's subconscious mind, than it is in its raw storytelling ability. As Gyllenhaal himself puts it, What is Donnie Darko about? I have no idea, at least not a conscious one. While making this movie, no one ever had a simple answer to this question, and that, ironically, is the very thing the film is actually about. There is no single way to answer any question. Every person's explanation differs according to how they were brought up. This seems like a very simple answer to a complex movie, but when you think about it, it gets to the very crux of what we all seem to take for granted. Our own minds, how they differ, and that we are entitled to our own interpretation. The struggle begins when, at a certain age, a kid starts to experience the effects of his childhood and the possibility that his upbringing was flawed. It's hard to accept the idea that there is no ideal. Nothing is perfect. The hardest part, though, is when he or she begins to search for their own idea of what is right. It's scary to search. You never know what resistance you might meet, but we can't be afraid to speak our minds. And it is this that makes Donnie Darko so cool. Jake put this very well, and so I cannot recommend enough that you watch this film in its entirety and form an interpretation of your own. For me, personally, Donnie Darko is the most impactful movie ever made. It possesses the vague undertone of a dream. When I first watched it, as a kid, it changed my life. It adjusted my perspective as to how far we can stretch the boundaries of what is possible in this world. It taught me that imagination is a gift and that we can create anything. Subscribe for more content like this, turn on notifications, and leave a like to help support the channel. See you next time.